Well, uh, my name is Jose Hernandez, and I'm a former NASA astronaut. Former because I just left the astronaut corps, uh, and I flew on STS-128 in 2009 aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery. Went on a 14-day mission to space. Uh, we docked with the International Space Station and uh, spent those 14 days conducting science, doing three spacewalks and taking over seven tons of equipment to the space station. The question is how I got here to become an astronaut. And uh, I think I have a very interesting story, particularly because I'm a first generation Mexican American. My parents come from the state of Michoacan and we were a migrant farm working family. Our routine was very simple. Uh, the year for us started in, in February where my dad would put us four kids into the car with my mom and we would make a two-day trip to, to Southern California, Ontario, Chino area and we would work in the uh, picking strawberries. Then we would move up to Salinas uh, a month later and then we would work picking uh, lettuce and uh, hoeing sugar beets, uh, thinning out the sugar beets and, th and uh, cleaning the grass. Finally, after a month of that, we would go up to the Stockton Modesto Tracy area and we would uh, work on everything that grew during the summer there. We started off with uh, cucumbers, cherries, uh, green tomato for market, peaches, end of the season uh, around November with the grape harvest. At the end of the grape harvest, my dad would then put the four kids back in the car with my mom and uh, we would make what would now be a two and a half day trip back to Michoacan. Come February of next year, the process will repeat itself. So you can see we had a pretty disruptive early education uh, experience for us because we went to three or four different school districts throughout the year. We missed about three months with our school. Granted, my parents always told our teachers, uh, t told us to tell our teachers to give us three months worth of homework. So we self-studied in Mexico during those three months. But uh, in spite of that, I was able to fulfill my dream of becoming an astronaut. When I was in the second grade, uh, we had a uh, sec I had a second grade teacher, Mrs. Young, and uh, and and I'm the youngest of the four of my family. And I, that particular November, it was getting time to go back to Mexico, and my dad asked us to tell our teachers to get three months worth of homework. So we went ahead and uh, and did it, and of course Mrs. Young was a little uh, was a little upset because she had been through this with my three other siblings, and so she finally told me to tell my parents that she was going to come home and visit us, and she did, and she basically told my parents that uh, it was uh, we ought to consider staying in one place because uh, they had kids that looked like they liked school, and to give us a chance to study, we had to be in one place. And so we end up making Stockton our home. And instead of traveling throughout California, now we just came straight from Mexico into Stockton. And we would go back to Mexico. And our trips to Mexico got cut instead of three months, three weeks centered around Christmas vacation. So we miss a lot less school. We, we, uh, our education started to get traction. I finally started uh, learning the English language a little more proficient. And, um, and, and then that's when we uh, ended up going to junior high there in Stockton, uh, to Franklin High School there in Stockton, and then undergraduate, I decided to major in engineering. I ended up majoring uh, in electrical engineering at the University of Pacific in Stockton, and then graduate school was UC Santa Barbara. I went into engineering because uh, to me it was a natural. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't learn the English language proficient enough to say that, that I spoke English till I was about 12 years old. So before that time, my only refuge was math because two plus two is four in any language. And, uh, and so even after I learned the English language, I was naturally uh, comfortable with math and sciences. And so that's why one of the biggest reasons why I went into uh, engineering. At first, when I was young, um, you know, I used to go to Mexico and I knew how to speak Spanish, but even then, because I didn't go to school there, I spoke Spanish incorrectly. And so kids would make fun of me and say, hey, you're not from here. Then I would come to California, and of course I couldn't speak English. 
uh, correctly. And they said, hey, you're not from here. So at first, it's kind of like, okay, well, who am I? Where do I belong? This, you know, I had a bunch of issues like that that I sort of felt I didn't belong neither here nor there growing up in the bicultural environment. But then as I got into high school, I started uh, appreciating the fact that we were bicultural. I remember one day we were working in a float uh, for homecoming, and my dad was a truck driver, so he had a flatbed. And, of course, all the kids uh, from my class would come, and we would work on the float. And my mom, you know, my dad would take out the radio, put on music. My mom would bring out Kool-Aid and make tacos and feed the whole, all the kids. And, and that's when, uh, you know, a friend of mine just sort of came to me and said, uh, I said, wow, he says, you've got an amazing family. You know, and we lived in this little house, rented house, very small, uh, very, very humble uh, and, you know, these kids were kids that had a little bit more means. Uh, so they had, you know, the, ni the nice cars, the nice homes, but yet they were envious of my family. And that's when I finally realized, I said, you know, uh, being bicultural is, is not bad. I started learning that I can take the, the best from both cultures and mold it. And, and, you know, that's what made me. I, the person that I am today. So now I embrace it. And that's what I tell kids. I say, hey, uh, it's an advantage being uh, bilingual. It's an advantage being bicultural because you can take the best of both cultures and make it into your own. It was the uh, tail end of the Apollo program. Uh, and then I was in the third grade. And uh, I remember uh, we were, we were um, watching TV and uh, the program got, got preempted. Uh, because it was Apollo 17 moonwalk. Uh, and back in those days, uh, you know, it, the moonwalks came on TV live, and Walter Cronkite would narrate these uh, moonwalks. And, you know, the whole nation and the whole world, for that matter, would stop and watch in amazement that humans were on the surface of the moon. Our family was no different. Uh, only difference is that, you know, we had this old beat-up black-and-white vacuum tube TV uh, with the integrated speakers and you know we didn't have cable so we had the rabbit ear antennas to improve reception and and so anytime anything important came on of course my father would ask me to adjust the antenna and of course you know now that I'm an electrical engineer I know why this happens as soon as you touch the antenna the reception improved and, uh, and so my father would always say stay there so here I am watching the moonwalk holding the antenna and you know, getting a bird's eye view, if you will, of the uh, moonwalk, and it was it was just amazing. Uh, I remember also that you know when they allowed me to let go, they had their fill of watching it. I would sit in front of the TV, in amazement, and then I would run outside and see the moon up there. And I would go back inside and see Gene Cernan walking on the surface of the moon. Go back out, did that three or four times throughout the moonwalks, and I just said, that's amazing. I I, uh, I want to be an astronaut. But what I did is I shared that with my, with my parents that night. You know, and uh, what, what they told me really surprised me because what my dad did is he sat me down in the same kitchen table that my mom always makes us sit right after we get back from school to do our homework. You know, where she makes tortillas and, and soup or, or, or sopa to uh, feed us. We weren't allowed to get out of there until we finished our homework. So that same table, my dad said, well, so you want to be an astronaut? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I think you can do it. He said, let me give you the recipe of how you can do it. Let me give you the ingredients. He said, the first one, he said, is you have to know what you want to be when you grow up. And I said, oh, that's easy. I want to be an astronaut. Second, he says, you have to understand where you're at now, how far you are away from that goal. And I said, okay, well, we're migrant farm workers. Yeah, we're pretty far away from it. Third, he says, you got to draw yourself a roadmap of all the steps necessary to get there. And you can't skip steps because that means when you get there, you're, gonna, you're not going to be well prepared. I said, okay, I could do that. Then he says, the fourth thing is you have to get yourself an education. Because without an education, you're not going to be able to do it. I said, I agree with that. The fifth and final thing he says is you got to bring the same work ethic 
that you have in the fields picking cucumbers or cherries or tomatoes, you got to put that into the books and then you got to put that into your professional job once you graduate college. It says you mix all that and you can be whatever you want. And so I remember going to bed that day so happy that I that I knew I was going to be an astronaut because my parents said I was. So if they said I was, it means I was. And in drawing that roadmap, that's when I realized at that young age that, hey, I have to be something in the sciences, in the engineering. And so that's when I started focusing even more so in math and science. And I said, that's what I want to do. And then in high school, of course, I wanted to make sure I took all the math classes that were available, all the chemistry and physics classes that were available, so I can be well prepared going to college. And that's what started my career towards a engineering career. I knew I had to be an engineer, and I, wanted, and I liked uh, electricity, so I said electrical engineer. And when I went to high school, I mentioned that I took all the math classes I could, all the science classes that I could, and I was a decent student. I was an A, B student, you know, in top 20 of my class. Uh, so I thought I was, you know, adequately prepared to go and, and face the challenges and the rigors of an engineering curriculum at a university. So I went straight to the university, University of Pacific. And let me tell you, the uh, first semester that I was there, it was, it was an eye-opening experience. You know, I, I had signed up for Fortran programming language class. I had signed up for calculus class. I had signed up for physics class. Uh, and then I had signed up for a chemistry class and a humanities class, you know, standard engineering curriculum. And it was kicking my butt. Uh, you know, it was tough. It was very tough. And that's the thing I want to make sure uh, the students realize is that, you know, Engineering curriculum is a tough curriculum, but if you stick with it, like I did, you know, I thought I was going to drop out, flunk out, or change majors, but I stuck with it, and man, I am so glad I did because it got easier as time went by, and uh, and and so that and and so that's when I uh, knew that I got through that first year of engineering that I was going to make it, and that I was going to keep pursuing my dream of wanting to become an astronaut. Before I got my master's. Um, the university I went to, it was a five-year engineering program because there was a co-op uh, uh, component to it. There was two time periods of six months where I would go out and work out in industry. And so during my two co-ops, I worked at a place called Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, uh, which was very good. It's a, uh, it was, it's a very prestigious uh, re research laboratory funded by the Department of Energy. And the fact that I worked there as a, as a co-op student when I finished my master's, allowed them to uh, offer me a career position there. So I worked 14 years there before going on to NASA at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. As, as I got my five years experience at Lawrence Livermore Lab, I started applying, I started applying to, the NAS, to the NASA astronaut program because uh, that was one of the requirements you had to have so many years experience in work. And as I started applying, I learned about the process of how one becomes an astronaut. And the process, each time they select an astronaut class, the process is very simple. They take all the astronaut applications, they review them, and this is about anywhere from three to 4,000 a year that they review. Out of those, they take a look at, select about 300, where then they take a closer look at them. If you have technical publications, they'll, they'll read them. They may talk to your bosses, and then from those 300, you get what's called the lucky 100 finalists. Mm -hmm. Lucky 100 finalists because these 100 get invited to spend one week in Houston at Johnson Space Center, where you spend one week and you, you, uh, you get a battery of medical exams, battery of psychological exams, interviews, tours, and then after the week's over, you go home, and you wait and see if you get selected. Out of those 100, though, about 20% get medically disqualified, usually eyesight, e hearing, or something wrong with their heart that they didn't know about. So that leaves about 80 qualified. Out of those 80 finalists, NASA invests in about 40 
to uh, do security background checks, make sure you pay your taxes, you're not a convicted felon, and all that kind of stuff. So that leaves 40 finalists. Out of those 40 finalists, that's when they select their class of 10 to 15 astronauts, depending on how many they need. And that's what makes up the astronaut corps each time they select a new class. Now, in my particular case, I started applying the very first year. You know, they sent me a form letter saying, hey, thanks for applying. Don't call us. We'll call you. Second year, they did that. Third year, they did that. It wasn't until the sixth year that I made it to the 100 finalists. I was interviewed, passed my medical exams, did all the tests, was in the 40 because I got a background check. So I figured, hey, I'm, I got a shot again. Being, being a 40 finalist is pretty good. So maybe I'm going to get selected. And guess what? I didn't. So I had to wait another two years for the next selection round. Again, I made it to the 180, 40. This time I was a little bit more humble and didn't think I was going to get selected, which was a good thing because I didn't get selected. But during that time, that's eight years into my application process now. During that time, I got invited to come work at NASA as an engineer. They said, hey, we like you. You're close to getting selected, but we need to know more about you. And we can't guarantee you that you'll get selected. We can't even guarantee you that we'll even interview you next time. But here's this engineering job. Would you like to come and take it? And by the way, you earn too much at Lawrence Livermore Lab, so you're going to get paid 15% less. And so by this time, I had like 14 years at NASA. And, and, and I said, wait, you know, uh, you know, what should I do? Should I do it or shouldn't I do it? And it wasn't until my wife told me, she said, you know, you should do it because you're always going to have that doubt, what if? I said, let's just go do it, and if you don't get selected, we'll just come back. So I went back, so I accepted, and I left Lawrence Livermore Lab. And my eighth year of applying, I went to NASA, worked as an engineer. As soon as I got there, they announced that they wouldn't select another class till four years from then. So I said, oh, man, I'm going to be here four years before I even find out anything. So four years pass. That's 12 years into my application process. Again, I get interviewed. 80, 40, and this time in 2004, that's when I got selected. So it was 12 years of applying where I finally got selected as an astronaut. And so I guess the only other ingredient I would add to my father's recipe, that sixth, sixth ingredient, would be perseverance. I would tell folks that if you want to go, don't ever give up. Don't give it up. If you don't reach it the first time, Take a step back, prepare yourself, and then try again. You don't do it the second time, take another step back, prepare yourself even better, and try again, and keep doing it. I mean, it took me 12 times. 11 times, you know, I filled out that application year after year. So it's a little bit of perseverance that's needed, and I think, uh, you know, that would perfect my father's recipe for success in life. We got selected in 2004. The 2004 class made up the 19th class of astronauts. And uh, when you get there, obviously you're not eligible for flight assignment because you have to train. So the first two years is dedicated strictly to training to become an astronaut. They sent us to flight school in Pensacola. They taught us how to uh, co-pilot jets, T-38 jets. Uh, they sent us to water survival land survival training, winter survival training, and then we started working in simulations uh, in the simulator where we would simulate blast-offs working in space and landings. And we would, uh, we would work in these trainers where during the blast-off they break systems, electrical systems, life support systems, power systems, everything that, that, you know, propulsion systems uh, that could go wrong, they would throw at you just to, so, so that you learn how to react to different failures. So you went through this rigorous, rigorous two-year training program where there's written tests and, and uh, simulations uh, that, where they tested you, and you had to pass everything. Once you did that, which took us to 2006, now you're eligible for a flight assignment. But while you're eligible for a flight assignment, 
you also get a technical assignment. So you still keep training as an astronaut. About 25% of your time is, is, is retention training that you keep doing. But then 75% of the time, you, you have a technical assignment. My technical assignment was to go to Florida right before I launch and prep the inside of the vehicle, uh, check out uh, the, the, uh, the systems inside the shuttle uh, that they were working properly, comm systems, uh, set up all the switches, set everything up into launch configuration so that the crew that came in would then uh, would, would do minimal amount of work, prep work, and then they would launch. As a matter of fact, we would stay in there until the crew came in and actually launched. We would strap him in, close the uh, hatch, go out, and then watch him launch. And, uh, and so I did that for another two years from 2006 to 2008. 2008, I got, launch, I got, I got uh, assigned a mission. Once you get assigned to a mission, you quit your technical job and you go into training full time for 18 months. Uh, that took us to the middle of 2009 and, uh, and that's when we actually went into space uh, on Discovery August 28th and came back September 11th of 2009. The uh, launch is something just amazing. Uh, I was the flight engineer, which means uh, I sit in the, in the, uh, f in, in the cabin flight cabin uh, and uh, in the flight deck and in front of me to my left is the commander in front of me to my right is the pilot and I'm sort of in the middle but a little aft a little behind but I have the best seat in the house because I have the panoramic view and I have that because I'm I'm watching all the systems as flight engineer I'm in charge of monitoring the systems and helping the commander or helping the pilot if the system uh, malfunctions knowing what to do, what the response is, or what, how to mitigate, minimize uh, those failures. And uh, so we're sitting there, and of course we have the orange pumpkin suits, pressurized suits, and uh, about three seconds before launch, uh, the three engines start. So you close your visor, initiate your air, so your suit has air. And you, even, even though your helmet's closed, you hear this gentle rumble. You feel this gentle vibration, the three engines start it. About two seconds later, the two side solid rocket boosters that are only gonna be on for two and a half minutes, then they pop off for two and a half minutes, but two seconds later, those light up. And when those light up, you can't throttle those. I mean, those are solid rocket boosters. Uh, once they light, you know you're going somewhere. You don't know where, but you know you're going somewhere. But the the, the uh, noise level goes up in order of magnitude. Now you hear this loud noise going, going through your helmet. The vibration is like more violent. You know, you've got your helmet doing this thing kind of thing. And then, and then just when you think the whole thing is going to like fall apart, you feel a push in your back because you're on your back. You feel a push in your back and that's the liftoff. So now I look to the side and you see the tower stay behind as you lift off. And now you're off to the races. Uh, you start off at zero miles an hour, and it only takes eight and a half minutes to get up into space. So the first two and a half minutes, the solid rocket boosters provide the main thrust of the of, of, of going up. In two and a half minutes, they extinguish, they pop off, uh, fall down in parachutes, and are recovered by boats on in the ocean, Atlantic Ocean, and are reusable. Then the center tank starts off, you know, it's the one that's feeding the three engines, keeps feeding the three engines for another six minutes. So you go from zero miles an hour in eight and a half minutes total when you're up in space, you're traveling 17,500 miles an hour. So that's the kind of acceleration you're going through in those eight and a half minutes. Now, at eight and a half minutes, the three engines throttle off, you throttle them off, the tank separates, the tank falls in the atmosphere, burns up into pieces, falls in the Indian Ocean. And now the shuttle is going by itself at 17,500 miles an hour around the Earth. That means you're going around the world once every 90 minutes. You get 45 minutes of daylight, 45 minutes of nighttime, 45 minutes of daylight, nighttime. Continuous. And, uh, and, and that's how you get into space. I mean, the forces are, are incredible. Uh, it's an amazing experience. But once you're in space, you can really feel it because the engines cut off, 
and now you're kind of like in a zero G environment. As soon as you wake up, every five minute time segment is spoken for all the way up until it's time to go to bed. And so, and everybody has a sheet like that, you know, flight day one, flight day two, all the way to flight day 14, you have your, you know what you're going to be doing that day. And there could be some changes, you know, Mission Control Houston will reprioritize things, but for the most part, you have your schedule to the five minutes. A lot of times, so for example, uh, you would get up and, uh, and then you would initiate some type of earth ops, uh, earth operations assignment where you have to do some photography. Uh, you've got some plant experiments you got to initiate. Uh, you got to do some medical experiments with maybe one of the crew members. Uh, you got to get the astronauts dressed for a spacewalk EVA that takes up a big chunk of time. You've got to operate the robotic arm while the astronauts are out, out there. That takes another big chunk of time. Uh, you know, so, so you, have, you have a bunch of things that you have to do. We took a, uh, a, a uh, cylinder called the Multipurpose Logistics Module in our payload bay that has over seven tons of equipment that we transferred to the International Space Station. So once we attached it to the station, you know, a lot of our time went into transferring uh, those materials and logging them onto the International Space Station. Uh, we assembled a treadmill for exercise, all kinds of things that we do uh, in space. And again, every time our time is accounted for. We do interviews. We've done live interviews. I interviewed live uh, here in the U.S. and interviewed live in Mexico. A reporter uh, called me up and we did a live interview. So it's those type of things that we do. I was the... Um, the very first astronaut to tweet bilingual in English and in Spanish. Well, after you come back, uh, typically what happens is they like to give you a rest from training. So they'll give you a desk job. And uh, my desk job was to go to Washington, D.C. and work at NASA headquarters. So I worked out of the Office of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs and basically uh, help develop space policy, help develop the uh, NASA budget, and work with uh, Congress to be able to uh, get buy-in with respect to the policy and the budget requests that we made to Congress for NASA. I spent one year doing that. When I got selected as an astronaut, uh, a foundation was started in 2006, two years after I got selected, in my uh, home city of uh, Stockton, California, called, uh, and they called Foundation Reaching for the Stars. Uh, they asked me to uh, provide their um, input into what the foundation should do because it was being named after me. And I told them that I would like them to focus on STEM-related activities. In other words, I would like to see kids in our community get more interested into the science, technology, engineering, and math fields. So this, this, uh, this foundation uh, started raising funds, started giving scholarships, started having workshops for the kids, inviting them to come to the University of Pacific and Delta Community College. Uh, we, even, uh, we even started taking a page from a program here in Texas at UTSA called Text Prep, where, uh, where we're trying to copy a lot of the program structure of Text Prep in at the University of Pacific with the Reaching for the Stars Foundation to create summer programs to strengthen the uh, math and science abilities of our kids as they go from one grade to another during elementary, middle school, and, and high school. So, uh, so that's the purpose of the Reaching for the Stars Foundation. I'm pretty proud of it. I'm grateful that it's been named after me, and I'm grateful to be associated with it as I help it as much as I can. I have gone back to my community in, in Modesto, Tracy area, and uh, while the unemployment rate is, at that time when I decided to run, was about 9.1%, in our area it was 18 to 24%, depending on what trades were involved. And, you know, I remember uh, back to when my father basically told me, you know, you can be whatever you want if you follow this formula. And he said it because we're here in the United States. We're able to reach the American dream if 
you're willing to get yourself an education and work hard. I started talking to some folks in my community, you know, folks similar to my parents at, the, at that age uh, were, you know, I was nine years old and they were whatever age they were. And I started talking to parents in my community similar to the stage we were in. And I've noticed that the parents were losing hope for their kids. And, you know, I'm a very strong advocate of education. And I also believe education starts at home. And I started telling myself, my God, if parents start losing hope, because that's where education begins, then uh, we're really doomed. And so I had the opportunity to run for Congress now. And I believe I should take that opportunity because if you have an, the ability to make a difference in a positive way, I think it's one civic duty to, uh, to go ahead and embrace that opportunity and try to make a difference. And so that's why I'm running is I want to make sure I preserve that the ability for us to be able to reach the American dream. And I want to make sure that all, all everything is in place with respect to what Congress can do to make sure that the American dream is preserved and that people believe in it because it's very important. And that, that, like I said, it starts at home. And if the parents don't believe in it, it's going to be an even steeper hill for the kids to climb up and succeed. I think uh, what I would simply do is, uh, is recommend that same recipe my parents gave to me. In other words, uh, you know, really sit down and decide what is it you want to do. Really understand where you're at. Draw yourself a road map so you understand how to get there. Bring a strong work ethic. Get yourself an education. And then sprinkle perseverance. Don't give up. That's my added ingredient. I think you've put that together. I don't care what age you are. I don't care what country you live in. I think you can improve your situation by following that. So that's the advice I would give them. I would say to, to expose them to as much uh, as is possible with respect to showing them the benefits of technology. I think it's clear, it's very clear that technology is what's going to push a country forward. And we need to invest in not only education, but with an emphasis in the STEM fields. You know, there's an old saying that says that any country that out-educates us today is going to out-compete us tomorrow. So we better make darn sure we're putting in the resources in our education system to ensure that we remain competitive uh, from a global perspective.